Let me open up tonight by reading a passage of scripture and share what God had put on our heart for this place. If you want to follow along with me, I'm going to start out of Ephesians in 4, in verse 1. As I was seeking the Lord over the past few weeks about what, what could I bring uh, to this place, there was one word that kept sticking out in my heart. And as I began to pray and seek about that, you know, my heart was wondering, oh, Lord, only you know what this place would need. And I've learned, at least in my 12 and plus years going on, I hardly don't know anymore. It'll be 20 before I know it. But as I've been in this for 10 plus years now at this point, I, I've learned to lean on following what he puts in our heart and just going for it. Because usually if we don't step out on that thing God's giving us, we miss what he was trying to say. The word that came to my heart for this occasion was the word unity. And as I begin to pray about that, I begin to think about all the problems that are in the world today that were not not there years and years ago in the way that they are now. We have people, and I'm just going to hold it up, even though it is how I'm reading from it. We have people today that are being held captive by a whole new thing. Everything that is inside the presence of technology and the power that it has over people's emotions, over their motives, over what they choose to live their life to do, over how they choose to measure up against other people. It's driving them to do things, make poor choices, and lead a life that God would not have for them to do. But I'm reminded that even though the world we live in is changing the way it is influencing people, that we still have the same God that is our help. And I'm reminded today that when I found Him in my brokenness, when I received God in my worst distress, the one thing that was present that brought me to Him was unity. Now I begin to think about the power of unity. You see, unity was people that prayed for me when it was just three, four, or five people that knew just how broken that I was. But yet as they came together to pray for me, unity began to move the hand of God. And as I think about the problems we're facing in this world, we have more churches than we've ever had before that all have missions to change lives and move in great ways. But oftentimes our missions may not line up to truly meet the needs that are out in front of us. My friends, I want to remind you, we are in a wicked world that needs to be reminded of the truth of God's word. There are people that are starving that need our hands to be charitable and giving and kind. We need to be the kind of people with our arms open to receive those who may not even understand themselves, but yet we can lead them to understand God. Unity. Ephesians 4 and 1 says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all. And through all and in you. Now I'll share with you the, the thoughts that God put in my heart to bring to this place. Unity is the secret weapon against our enemies. It is the love that unites us when Satan would try to separate us. I think about that and how easy it is for us to stumble on such short-fused, quick-tempered matters. And not to let God have an opportunity to use this thing to bring us together. Oftentimes we have emotional and defense mechanisms that go up before we even learn to understand the other side of an individual's argument. It began to put a story in my mind about a co-worker that I was having difficulties with in coming together. And I remember sitting in the office that day once when this person all but unloaded on me, letting me know how much I was not doing the things they wanted me to do. Anybody ever been there before? Maybe it's just me. You ever had somebody be that way? 
And all that I could do in that moment was just sink in my chair because I had a flood of emotions come up where I wanted to speak my mind, but then I thought, no, I better not do that. And then I, then I had a flood of emotions that became de defensive and I wanted to justify myself and I, I didn't do that. And I remember walking out of that place so defeated. But yet as I began to pray about it, God showed me that saying nothing was better than saying something in an ill state of mind. And I remember in the weeks to come that God began to put on my heart to look after and have the back of this individual. And I think I began to surprise my co-worker when I would start doing things and saying things and warning of things that were coming in the workplace. Office politics can be brutal, as you know. And I helped her over the weeks to come. And I remember in weeks to come, God gave us a moment where she finally brought down her wall and said, I'm glad that we are able to work together. And I appreciate what you're doing. And it was finally that moment and opportunity where I could minister what God had laid on my heart. And I remember telling her in that moment, all that I know to do is to do to you what I would want done to me. And in that moment, I was reaching across and we were coming together. That was unity. Sometimes we think the only thing that we can do to have a resolution with our enemies is to push them away and continue our agenda. But I want to remind you that there are many broken people today that need you to drop your guard, forgive them, and reach for them that they may find Christ. If I had not had somebody that loved me enough, in spite of the faults I had in my life, I would have never found God. Yeah. And it's, it's convenient when we get saved in the church house, and it's convenient when we have the pastor come by our house, but sometimes... We're going to have to be the hands and feet of Jesus that reach out to others' hearts and make the difference in their life. What can separate the love of God in us? Nothing if we're unified. I want to read a passage now out of Jeremiah 29 and 13. And it says, And you shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. God gave me this to share. Before we work to join others in unity, let us first examine our life and heart before God. And then ask ourselves, are we at one with His will? I learned that I, I like to go to church and I enjoy being in the presence of His people. But if I'm not in His presence, then I may not be as beneficial of a member, as a brother, to all of my folks in church if I'm not one with God. There's something about coming together with God in your own life that helps you to be a better individual to those that need you to be strong. The scripture said, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. But that's assuming you are unified with God to become strong in Him. If we're turning Him away, and rejecting his call to bring us closer to him. I'll be real with you. It's hard to come together with anybody. And at some point if you get so miserable in your stuff. You won't even be able to enjoy yourself in church. Anybody been there? I'll admit I'm, maybe I'm the only one that's ever done it. But I've been so miserable before after hearing something that somebody else said. That it just rubbed me the wrong way. And I couldn't come in and be myself. That's that flesh coming up right and it kept me from being in unity with God and above all unity with my brothers and sisters. How many of you know that people are watching everything that you're doing and testing your ability to walk with God? They are. Even in this moment, I know that I'm being watched. But in this moment, so are you. We're all being challenged to step up and do more. But I couldn't even stand here tonight unless I acknowledged my oneness with God. He saved my life when I had nothing left. And by had nothing left, I mean had nothing left. He took a drug-addicted, alcohol-infused individual and brought him into unity. That's powerful. That's something that we shouldn't be ashamed of. And I am not. I am in unity with God because I remember when I didn't have somebody to come to. 
I was broken. I didn't have a place to go. But thank God for praying, loving, giving people that prayed in spite of my faults that I was able to find God. Each and every day that I've lived since He's delivered me, I've done my best to be at one with Him. But I've not always got it right. And there's some times that when we come to the Father, the only thing we really need to do is not ask for more, but pray for the things we failed in. I found that I become stronger when I acknowledge my faults and grow than to ask for more that I cannot carry. God gives us the ability to understand the things that are keeping us at a, at a gap between how close we could be to God. If I could illustrate that in one way, sometimes there's just one thing we've not forgiven from somebody to truly be in unity with them. We'll be able to shake hands with them. We'll be able to be pleasant with people. But there's still just that one little thing that's living up inside of our mind that keeps us from truly being together. That's the same way we are with God. We want to put our own conditional things in front of Him and say, I will live for you if you'll tolerate my behavior. But that's not unity. Unity is one being in surrender with the other to achieve agreement and alignment together. Let me read this next scripture to you. It's out of Matthew chapter 18, verse 19. It says, Again I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. This is what I put down as I was praying about this. Our differences should lead us to find the strengths in one another, not our faults. I think we as a world that is under the strongest grip of judgment I've ever seen, we can't even go out the door with what we have on before five people have judged what we put on to wear that day. And even tonight, I may walk out of here and feel like I did a great job, but there might be somebody in here that doesn't appreciate what I'm doing. And that's okay. But I'm reminded that what divides us is special. What divides us is because we are uniquely different. The Bible said we were beautifully and wonderfully made. So that tells me if I judge you harshly instead of acknowledging our differences and seeing it as your strength, then I'm not in unity with you. I may not be the, the best singer in the world. I may not be the best musician in the world. But I love to worship Him even if I'm not the one that's singing. And the things that make us different are what make us special. And I know that there are some people that are in our world today that look very different than we do. That talk very different than we do. That are in a different struggle than we're walking in. But that doesn't give us the right to judge them and never help them. That should be the reason we should acknowledge that they are special. That they are somebody. That they're not too far gone. That God can help them and make a difference. Some of this you may be saying, Brother, I already know all this. You're, you're preaching to the choir. And if I am, hopefully the choir will sing hallelujah, amen, brother, preach on. Because it's the truth. <clears throat> we have to look at one another and find the strengths that we have. Because we're all human. We need companionship. We need encouragement. The Bible said not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together. That's because we need each other. Right. We need that encouragement. We need to feel the unity with someone so that we can be stronger. Let me read another passage. Luke chapter 6 verse 37 says, Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. And I'll read this. It says, There is a world of people who are looking for unity that can help make a difference. I love when God's people come together in church. Do you know why? Because where there is unity, there is His presence. Because we have got ourselves out of the way. We have invited the Holy Spirit of God to take control of the service. And guess what? People begin to feel things that they didn't feel before they got here. They begin to feel better in a way that they didn't when they arrived. And above that, you cultivate the spirit of conviction that if people need to change their life, they begin to feel that they are not in unity with Christ. But oh my goodness, we haven't got there most of the time. Can I preach for a little while? Is this okay? 
Did you bring your steel-toed boots tonight? I hope you did, because here's the truth. If we're not in unity with ourselves, we're not coming together as a body. And if we're not coming together as a body, then we're not producing the spirit of conviction. And if there is no conviction, there is no change. If we want change to happen in this nation, in our county, in our community, we have to come together with God. We have to start within ourselves and say, Lord, if there's anything that I need to get rid of so I can be closer to you, help me to let it go that I can be a stronger individual and walk in your love. And if we get that far and we are here in the body of Christ, then if somebody's testifying, you ought to be the first one out of the gate that says, Amen. I'm so glad you said that. You ought to be the first one to hug their neck if they've never testified before. You ought to be the first one to come in with a song. Nobody should wait on you to be ready to sing the praises of the Lord. And when you come together in that moment, the people that need that special touch from God have the right circumstances and admiration atmosphere to receive it. Amen. Without unity, there will be no community. We have to come together and reach for those that are in need. That is the purpose of the church, to go out to the hedges and the highways and compel them to come. But I find that our voice hardly compels our own selves to be here. Well, I think I'll get there tonight if I'm in the mood. Well, Depends on who's preaching. If old such and such is going to do it, I don't know about that. Doesn't sound like we're in unity with our church, does it? I believe that even if you feel like somebody needs to grow in the Lord, you probably are the one God's called to encourage them to grow. Amen. I had people in my whole life that after I would preach, they'd come and sometimes it felt like they were saying the harshest things. But you know what they were doing? They were helping me grow. Funny story, one time I went to a place and I, I got through preaching and as you know I have a bit of excitement in my, in my message and how I'm talking tonight. But I, I, I walked up and one individual said, Brother, I really, really wanted to enjoy your sermon, but I couldn't. And I was like, well, what are you talking about? And he's like, you were talking too fast. I couldn't understand what you were saying. Slow down. So... God has a funny way of getting us to a point where we learn to change the things that we do so that we can make a difference into other people's lives. I want to read one last scripture tonight, if that's okay, out of Luke chapter 15 and verse 4. And everything I've talked about comes together to this moment. And it says, What man of you having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness to go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he had found it, he lay it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he called together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which is lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. There's two things I want to bring out of this part. The first thing is we don't need to be just persons. We don't need to just be bodies in the room. We don't just need to be an attendance marker. We need to be a difference maker. We need to be people that are contributing to our church services in a positive way, however you are called to do that. It would, it would feel a bit different if we all did it the same way. That would be unison, right? But I'm not talking about unison. I'm talking about unity. I'm talking about community. You being you and worshiping God the way you worship Him. And even if it's different than somebody else, at least they know they have someone else that's trying. That's why I keep coming to church. I have people beside me where I go in attendance that testify about their struggles they're going through. That people that are going through cancer, financial hardships... They're in the valley of decision. They're, they're waiting on God to move in things. And I'm encouraged to hear that even though they don't have the answer, they're believing for the answer because they know the answer who is God. That's the powerful thing about this. The other thing I want to bring out of this here is that unity will cause us to celebrate God's true plan for humanity. His true plan for humanity was to save those who were lost. 
Because as we know, God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whosoever would believe would not perish. God's Word also told us that it was not His will that we would suffer or not be able to take on more than we can handle, but that He would make a way of escape for us. So I give you this as closing remarks. You may be in a struggle today with some things that are keeping you from letting go and being one with God. Whatever it is, I encourage you, it is not worth your time, your emotional expense, and the days that will be wasted that could have been opportunities to do something better than to just wallow in our suffering. The devil would have you stay there forever. It was his will in the prodigal son's account that he would have stayed in the slop and never realized that there was something better. But there was a call to unity in the pig pen too. He said, I shall go back to my father's house. He remembered a place where he had togetherness, family, oneness, unity. It's powerful. The purpose that God sent me here tonight was to also remind you that you are not just one person here. You are one body here. And when one limb of the body would suffer, the Bible said the whole body would suffer. And we should be careful to remember that just because it's good for us doesn't mean it's great for everyone. And if it's good for us, chances are it's our turn to step into the bowels of compassion and say, Lord, please help those in need. Sometimes we think we just are entitled to have a good day. But I've learned that God gives me good days so that I can help somebody else. God blesses me so that I can pour out of my life and help somebody else. God takes my broken pieces, brings them together so that I can pour out into somebody else's life. I'm one with Him. That I can come and be one with you so that we can be one with God. One body. One spirit. That one spirit needs to send a message to people that there's hope for them in Christ. And my friends, it's easy to get caught in the motions and get distracted by the commitments and participation without the sincerity. But I want to remind you that if we get to a place where we are participating without sincerity, we are complacent. And complacency will lead you to being strayed from God. Short point on that is if you do not enjoy being at church and you have lost your sense of humility to worship Him, we need to check our stuff. We need to look inside of our heart. We don't need to point the finger anywhere else, but starting with self, that we may be with Him. And once you do that, I guarantee you the love of God. What is the evidence of God in us? That you love your neighbor, love your brothers and sisters. If that's not gleaming from your heart in fellowship with others, they're not here to judge you, but I'm here to tell you, you need to look inside yourself. You need to be the evidence of God's love for this world. That others may feel a sense of unity to be drawn to Christ. And I love being a part of a church and the community of church. But don't get lost in just being a church. Be a church who wants to reach the world. Don't lose, don't lose cause of your mission. Because people like me would not be here. I would not have been here. I would have been lost to an overdose. I would have been lost to suicide by now. But through unity of people's obedience, I'm still standing. Mm -hmm. That's why I still believe in the day we live in that we should tell all the great and not so great things about our life so that others can come together and find themselves in Christ. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If we don't do that, we're not preaching the truth. If people don't realize that they're in a mess, then we're not doing our job. That's conviction. Conviction can be given without having to beat them to death with the word. You can show them by how you live there's a better way to do it. That's right. And you can come together with people and make a difference like you never thought you could. 
I'm going to close right there. If my mother would come, who thought she was taking the night off, and come <laughs> sing a song for us, I just want to open the altar for anyone who would want to pray. Anyone that wants to close the gap on the things that are keeping them from a place where they feel like they're at one with God. It's important that you know that you are with Him and that He is with you. The Bible said if God be for us, then who could be against us? We're here to come together with you. God brought us all this way, all of us together as a ministry to remind you that we're here and we are together and we are serving the same God. But if you need encouragement, we're here to pray with you. We love you. We appreciate you. As they sing, if you want to stand, then we'll go ahead and open the altar. If you want to pray, I'll be up here waiting. God will bless you.